Good morning and welcome to the FSR Advanced Webinar entitled Grid Connection of Offshore Wind Farms that will be presented by Leonardo Meos, Research Fellow and Scientific Coordinator of the THINK project here at Florence Gulf Regulation. My name is Magdalena Moss and I'm a Training Coordinator here at Florence Gulf Regulation and I will be also moderating today's session. And before we will connect with our today's speaker, I would like to point out a couple of issues regarding the webinar agenda. So the first point is the introduction. This is exactly what I'm doing right now. In this point, I will also explain briefly the control panel that you can see right now in the upper right corner of your computer screen. Then we will be able to connect with Leonardo Meus and proceed with his presentation. Then in the next point, uh, we will continue with the Q&A section. In the Q&A section, uh, our today's speaker will reply for the questions submitted by the audience, and I will explain briefly how you can submit your question to Leonardo Meus briefly in just a couple of seconds. And the last point are the conclusions, so I will just conclude today's webinar with the final announcements. Okay, so this is the control panel that you can see right now on your computer screen. Uh, there are a couple of uh, features that I would like to explain now. The first one is this tiny little orange arrow. So if you would like to follow today's webinar on your full computer screen, you can always close this control panel uh, by clicking on this button here. However, if you would like to reopen it, just click in the same place. There is another option, you can uh, always check something on your computer or check something on the internet, but if you would like to still remain connected to our webinar, please click on the button below and uh, this, the whole webinar will be minimized, but the icon will remain on your taskbar. Okay, and below there is the hand rise tool, and this is the tool that I would like you to, to use right now. Therefore, if you can see me and if you can hear the, uh, you can hear me and if you can see the presentation on your computer screen, then please click here and I will know that everything is fine and that we can uh, proceed with the presentation of Leonardo, Leonardo Meus. I am looking right now, I can see that most of you have clicked. Thank you very much for that. However, if you have any problems and if you will have any problems also during the webinar, please use the question box that is here below. Uh, in this place also you can submit your question to Leonardo Meus and then I will ask him those questions during the Q&A section. Okay, so now finally we can connect with our today's speaker. So I will unmute Leonardo right now. Leonardo, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good morning to you all. Good morning. Uh, Leo, right now I, can, I will connect to your computer screen. I'm doing this right now. Perfect. Uh, I should, yes, now I am able to see your presentation. I think that everybody else as well. Uh, therefore, I leave you the floor. I will connect back to you in around 43 minutes. Uh, so, good luck. Thanks, Magda. So, as Magda already said, the title of today's webinar is The Grid Connection of Offshore Wind Farms. Let me say first a few words on why this topic. First, you have to know that there is a buzz on the internet. Now, what do we mean with a buzz? Google keeps statistics of how many times we search a certain word or term. And I had a look for you on the search statistics regarding offshore wind. Here's the graph. So what do we see here? First, we see that up to 2007, there is no graph. It means that the amount of times offshore wind was searched was not high enough for Google to register it. And then we see a big jump around 2007. So quite recently, in fact. And then this steadily increases with some interesting peaks here in 2010. These peaks correspond to certain events in the US and the UK. Um, one of them is the Google itself entering into offshore wind in, the, in front of the East Coast in the US. Another peak is the UK. In 2010, the UK did a, a, a round of concessions that were allocated to offshore wind. And I will come back to that. Let me just also tell you what's below. Below, you see the amount of times offshore wind is found in news, online news. And again, here you have a similar trend with um, this uh, amount of times becoming significant as of 2007 with several peaks in 2010. 
So that's the internet. Now let's go to the EU. So, why this topic? Well, in the EU context, this is also a very relevant topic. First reason is that offshore wind technology is becoming significant. Um, we only have around, in 2010, we had around 3 gigawatt only, but this is expected to increase to um, around 40 gigawatt by 2020. 40 gigawatt, just to give you an idea, is around the same as the peak load of Spain. So that's the technology. Now let's talk about money for the grid connection. So this is the money we are going to invest to connect these offshore wind farms to the existing grid. And just two numbers. Tenet, the Dutch TSO, now also active in the north of Germany, is already investing 6 billion to connect offshore wind farms in that area, north of Germany. The UK also is expected to invest uh, between 6 and 10 billion pounds. All of this just to connect offshore wind farms. To give you an idea of the order of magnitude, um, Ofgem provided a number that the current asset base onshore of the transmission grid in the UK is around 7 billion. So it means that the UK is expected to put the same amount of investment into the sea as it has done onshore uh, currently. So it's massive. That's why uh, we have this webinar today on this topic. But then another thing is why a webinar? Well, uh, we didn't start with a webinar to work on this topic. We actually started with this report. This is one of the THINK reports. As you can see here, very small, it's topic number five. So THINK is a, is a project, a European funded project, where we advise European Commission on diverse energy policy issues. And for this report, they asked us for advice on offshore grids. So what to do? Is it something that national member states uh, can take care of or is there any role for the EU? So you have here the report, roughly about 50 pages. And then what we did is also to make a policy brief, four or five pages, so that more people can read and our work is more accessible. The next step was to make a blog. All of this was er done earlier this year. Then we also contributed to this report. This is the report of Georg Willem Adamovic. He has been appointed by European Commission as the coordinator for offshore grids. In that report, you will find also a contribution from us based on this research. Now, all of, all of this has been done. The next step was to uh, work with Magda to translate this research into a webinar. Then how did we do that? Well, we like a webinar to be focused and interactive. So you see three boxes here. Basically, this webinar is organized around three questions. Let me tell you the three. First question, who should design and develop grid connection for offshore wind farms? Then the second part of the webinar will be about this question, who should pay for it? And the third question is, who should be the regulator for the grid connection of offshore wind farms? Now, prepare yourselves because I will ask your opinion about each of these questions before entering into what our research says about these questions. So, first poll, and I will guide you through the possibilities of the answers. So the question is, who should design and develop the grid connection of offshore wind farms? And there are three possible statements. The first is, well, we know that transmission system operators are connecting generators onshore, so why not just extend this uh, responsibility they have to offshore? Then B is no, we think offshore is something different, and here uh, it's better that generators themselves are designing and developing their connection to shore. That's statement B. C is for people that think, no, th this um, offshore uh, wind development is something completely different. Uh, we would like to have other parts uh, of the industry involved, maybe, maybe offshore shipping uh, business. And these people, these third parties, could be better at designing and developing the grid connection. So let's organize a tender so that these third parties can enter into this business. So these are the three options. And now I will launch this poll for you. Here we go. Yes. And I'll just wait until most of you have responded. I see voting is going very quickly. Thank you. Yes, you are very fast this morning. 
just wait a few seconds more. Okay, great. Let me close the poll and share the results with you. So here we go. As you can see, uh, most of you actually think that it should be TSOs uh, doing this. And then 16% um, think that it should be offshore wind farm developers and 16% third parties. That's a very interesting result. Um, so let me show you what our research says about this issue. I'm going to close this poll here. Yes. And I'm going back to my slides. Okay. So first, onshore. How do we do this to connect generators? Well, the regime is referred to as first come, first serve. So what happens is a generator is developing a power plant and then he goes to the or she goes to the TSO to ask for a connection. And the TSO deals with these requests on a first come, first serve basis. So it's a very simple procedure. Um, then if we look at this procedure from two uh, points of view, one is planning and the other is competition. These are two important principles for investment in transmission. You could say that planning is quite limited, no? It's just first come, first serve, so yeah, there is no big plan to connect generators. Um, then, if we look at an element of competition, there is not really one, because it is only TSOs that are able to design and develop connections. Now, is this an issue? First, onshore. Not really. I mean, these principles are not that important onshore. Why? Because when we connect a generator onshore, it's a quite standardized procedure. The cost is normally limited because we are connecting generators typically close to the existing grid and we have technology standards to do that. Now offshore, this is different. And this I will illustrate with, this, uh, with a graph. Let me guide you through this graph. So first on the X axis, you see time. So you see the different points in time we had an offshore wind farm development. Then on the y-axis you see distance, kilometers. So this is the distance of the farm to shore. So you see that in the, initially we had very close to shore wind, offshore wind farms. And as we move into time, we are also developing wind farms deeper into sea, even here going up to 350 kilometers from shore. Then you also see that the bubbles are becoming bigger. So this is the capacity of the project the installed capacity. So initially we had relatively small projects and now we are going to these bigger projects. You also see that these bigger ones here, this cloud, has a different color. The color corresponds to the technology. Initially all these uh, offshore wind farms were connected with the AC cable. Some of them high voltage, other, uh, others uh, medium voltage. Now these ones are connected with DC cables. And the reason is the distance because an AC cable has a limited distance. It's purely technical reasons. So it means also this distance that the cost of connecting these offshore wind farms is relatively high, much higher than generators onshore. And for these reasons, the principles of planning and competition are more important. But we will come back to this issue uh, throughout the presentation. Okay. Now let's go to what member states are doing. Here is Germany. So here you have a table of the offshore wind farms that already are, are, are developed or under development in Germany. So what you see here is the names of the wind farms, the year of commissioning, expected commissioning for these projects. So these are actually these big bubbles you saw in the previous graph. As you can see, they are indeed very far from shore and they are for large capacities and using this new technology. So, what has Germany done to deal with this new type of projects? Let's have a look at the regulatory regime of Germany. So, the connection regime is typically referred to as connection obligation. So, Germany did not change the fact that the TSO is fully responsible to connect offshore wind farms. So, it corresponds to the statement A what most of you thought was the best statement, so the best regime, the best model. And the, but the this, this slight adaptation is that the TSO cannot deal anymore with these requests on a first-come, first-serve basis, but is obliged 
to make sure that wind farms are connected whenever they are commissioned, so whenever they are uh, ready. Now, if we look at this regime, again, from the point of view of these two principles, planning and competition, this is what we get. First, planning. Well, because of this obligation, TSOs indeed uh, in Germany started to do more planning. And this is illustrated by the development of offshore electricity plugs. And I, I will discuss what that is. But if we look at the other uh, important principle, competition, there is not yet an element of competition in the German model. So what are these electricity plugs offshore? Well, let me show you one of these projects I had in the table before. It is Borwin. And Borwin actually has such a plug here. You can see that plug. And what it does is that it connects two uh, offshore wind farms into that plug and then you have a single cable going to shore. So basically you avoid having to have two very long cables. And here the plug is then a sort of uh, clustering of, of offshore wind farms. Now how does this plug look like? Is it really a plug? Here you have a very nice picture of the homepage of Elia. And they have represented it like this. So I just wanted to share this picture with you, but of course we know that it doesn't really look like this. And I will show you now the picture of the only plug that has actually already been constructed. And here it is. So it's a very nice piece of equipment, as you can see. It's around the size of a barn or a house. And up here, what you see is not a trampoline, no, it is a helicopter platform. So that people can arrive here and do maintenance. So what this thing does, is it's more than a plug. It's actually a converter station. Why? Remember that these very far offshore wind farms are connected to shore with DC. So here we have a DC cable that will go to shore and there it, the DC is converted back into AC of the onshore grid. And the wind farms, they are producing AC. So here we have AC coming in and DC coming out. That's what the plug is about. Okay, now Sweden. So the second member state we looked at. Also Sweden has a few offshore wind farms as you can see here. Actually even one of the early developments which was close, all of them close to shore and most of them also relatively small. So what did Sweden do uh, to, uh, to change the regulatory regime? Well in Sweden it could be described as uh, very simple, it's generators. So it's corresponding to statement B of the poll. Generators are designing and developing their own uh, connection. If we discuss or assess this regime, again from the point of view of our two principles, then first planning, there is no real planning because it's generators doing it and there is no uh, procedure to coordinate what different generators are doing. But from a competition point of view, this is interesting because every generator can have its own innovation in connecting its uh, offshore wind farms. Okay, now the last uh, member state we looked at, which is the UK. As you can see, this is a quite large table, so lots of uh, relatively um, recent developments in the UK. Um, most of them, of, however, in this table uh, are close to shore. Some of them are big ones, as you can see here, 500 megawatts. But the UK is also interesting not only because of what has already been developed, but what is expected. And here you have an illustration of what is expected. So initially all the uh, offshore wind farms I, I have in the table are relatively close to shore. Is this darker purple and red dots here and here. Now then, in 2010, you had uh, the third round of concessions that have been allocated and these are in this color as you can see here, here, here and here. So more far. And this is actually what created this buzz on the internet that I showed you in the beginning of my slides. Now, faced with these new projects, which are of the same distance uh, to shore as the, some of these German ones we showed earlier, the UK also started to develop a new uh, regime for offshore. And this regime is referred to as offshore transmission owners. Now, what is that? I have a little illustration here for you. So you have the generator developing the turbines and you have the existing onshore grid. And in between the two, 
what the UK regime does is to organize a tender for somebody to become an offshore transmission owner, whoever wins the tender, and you win the tender by proposing a certain scheme, a certain design for this um, uh, connection to shore. So actually in the UK you will have lots of offshore TSOs, it's a new business there, uh, as a result of these tenders. Now let's have a look at this regime from the point of view of the two principles we have been discussing up to now. So first planning. Well planning for the moment is not yet um, um, in, in so much in that uh, regime but it is going to, it's being considered in a, in a next step. Originally the regime was more focused on the element of competition. It's all about this tendering. Um, so the idea was to support innovation. And indeed uh, there is a report from Ofgem observing that innovation is not only technology but it's also about how these projects are financed and the type of and having third parties um, from for instance the offshore business entering into this business. Okay if we sum this all up remember we had these alternative models we had the model that is uh, TSO focused we had a model relying more on generators and a third one on third parties through tendering. Then, as I have uh, discussed, actually we have already three experiments with these uh, models. We have Germany experimenting with this model, Sweden with this and the UK with the third one. Then what the slides up to now said is that it's maybe not so important to, to have a favorite among these models. What matters is the implementation and whether this implementation has an element of planning and an element of competition. And then today's implementations of these models in these three countries resulted in this assessment, with Germany already having advanced connection planning, Sweden not yet, and UK considering it. And then from the point of view of competition, we had this result. For the moment, there is no element of competition in the German scheme, while we have it already in the Swedish and the UK scheme. Okay, now let's move to the second poll, the second question. Remember, this question is about who should pay for the grid connection of offshore wind farms. And I have two statements for you and would like you to choose one of them. First statement is, we think that offshore wind developers should pay, so the generator should pay for his own connection. Statement B is, no, we think that exempting them from this uh, connection cost is a good way to support um, this renewable energy, so we will um, smear out, uh, socialize the cost among all grid users. Okay, that's the poll. Let me now launch this for you. Here we go. So I will again give you some time. We are very fast, already half of you responded, thank you. Wait a bit more. Okay, that's very nice. Let me close here. This is a very interesting result. You are perfectly divided. It's, we ha really have a 50-50 uh, division of votes here. So half of you think statement A is correct and half B. Okay, let me go to back to the slides. So, let's discuss this issue through an example. And here is the example. First, I think it's very important to say, when we discuss who should pay, who should pay what? Because we can discuss the cost of connection actually has three different components. There is what we could call here the internal grid of an offshore wind farm. So that's these dotted lines here. Then this, this internal grid is, is connecting to an offshore platform. From this platform, we have a connection to shore. So this is the second component. And then the third component is actually here, the, the, the existing onshore grid. Because indeed, if we feed in uh, wind into this existing system here, we might create congestion and we might have to reinforce this part. So we have these three components. And then there is indeed three practices. The first practice is referred to as deep charges. In, if if a, uh, the regulatory model is like that, it means that the offshore wind farm developer pays for all three components. So he pays for the internal grid, for the connection and the reinforcement. That's deep charges. 
Another option is to have shallow charges. Shallow means that it doesn't pay for the grid reinforcement. And the last uh, possibility is to have super shallow charges. So in that system, you, as a wind farm developer, you only pay for your internal grid. Now, you could say that these three uh, schemes have a price signal, because there is always a signal, at least this cost here will be signaled, but the signal is much stronger if you also pay this or if you also pay that. So three degrees of uh, price signal strength, you could say. And let's discuss this now. So how important is it to have a price signal? Then I will discuss what is the relevance of this price signal offshore and the current practice. So first, the importance. There is two reasons why having a price signal could be beneficial. The first is that it can influence the decision to locate. That is true, indeed. If you get a signal that it's more expensive to locate in this area or that area, you might change the decision. So it's good to give you such a signal. Then another thing is that an offshore wind farm developer could change the timing of its development. Because if it waits, for instance, it could be cheaper to connect. Um, you can think of possibilities like that. Then is this relevant for offshore? First, regarding the decision to locate, we could say maybe not that relevant because we have these concessions and the location of an offshore wind farm is a bit constrained by that. But the other one is relevant. Why? Think of this example of electricity plugs in a situation in which a TSO is developing a plug but the offshore wind farm is ready earlier. If there is a price signal, um, the offshore wind farm developer could be motivated to wait to connect to this plug because the connection would be cheaper. Okay, so now we have argued that it's relevant. Now let's have a look at the current practice then. Germany does super shallow charges. So there, for instance, regarding these electricity plugs, uh, offshore wind farm developers do not really have an incentive to, to proactively cooperate with a TSO for this issue. Then Sweden has shallow charges. Why? Because its generators not only developing it, but also paying for it. So here you have a stronger incentive. In the UK, on the first uh, view, you have super shallow, but it's more complicated than this because you also have a locational G component in the transmission tariff. So in the end, they do receive a signal if you look at uh, the full picture. So you have this assessment. In Germany, we already we do not yet have this price signal, while in Sweden and the UK, we do have. OK, that brings us to the third and last poll. So who should be the regulator for the grid connection of offshore wind farms. And again, I have uh, two statements for you. First statement is we think it should be national regulatory authorities that take care of this. Just like in the examples of Sweden, Germany and the UK, each regulator can fine tune its own uh, regime, can experiment with the different options and gradually we will converge into something uh, that is more European. B is to say, no, we already now need some kind of regional EU regulatory framework because only national won't work. These are the two options and I will launch this poll again for you. Here we go. Okay, you are again answering very quickly, thank you. Yes, I have, okay, I can close, I have most of you, thank you. Here we go. Let me share the results also. So again, you are nicely divided. This time 40% of you thinks statement e, A is more correct, while 60% is already going for statement B. Let me again show you what our research says about that. Okay, back to the slides. So. First, it's easy to work with an example, and the example is Kriegersflak. And here you can see where Kriegersflak is located. So it's located, it's in the Baltic Sea, and it's between Sweden, Denmark, and Germany. Now, in this area of the Baltic Sea, we have a lot of potential for offshore wind. And in the case of Kriegersflak, we have about 
1,600 megawatts that might be developed in that area. And what is also interesting about the area is that it exactly crosses the economic zones of the three countries. So in fact you have three different developments, a Danish one, a Swedish one and a German one. Now the standard solution, let's call it the standalone solution, would be that each country follows its own regulatory regime to connect its own offshore wind. So that would result in three cables, as you can see here in this graph. Now, the TSOs uh, in this area got together and did a joint study to see if there could not be a different solution. And they came up with a combined solution um, showing that it has a bit higher costs, but the, these higher costs are outweighed by additional benefits you create by interconnecting the offshore wind farms. So this interconnection would actually allow us to have more trade between these three countries and there are indeed price differences, so this creates a trade value. So here we actually have the very first example of what a future offshore grid could look like. More and more offshore wind farms that are starting to be interconnected in, in a sort of grid. Then the next step is to say, is this possible under the current regulatory framework, which is mainly national? So in our report, what we did is we looked at this project and, and two more of them, um, and we saw that they typically have several uh, challenges. The main reason is that these national regulatory frameworks, as I have discussed before, are not aligned. So they work very well within uh, a country, but not if they are combined in a single project. Just to give you one example, First, this, this solution was studied by the three TSOs, but the Swedish TSO is actually not even responsible to connect offshore wind farms. So it's difficult to have cooperation among TSOs to do this kind of solution if they do not have harmonized uh, responsibilities. Another example of a difficulty is that this wind farm here, uh, close to Germany, was actually moving ahead quicker than the development of these offshore wind farms and remember that the German regime puts a very strong obligation on the TSO to connect whenever the wind farm is commissioned. So this original solution could already not be done anymore because the German TSO could not wait with connecting this uh, offshore wind farm. So in the end, if we will have a combined solution, it will be more a kind of hybrid solution. So these are just two examples of challenges and if you want to know all of them, I invite you to have a look at our report. The point to make is that Krieger's flag is not a standalone problem. So the future, in fact, might bring many more Krieger's flag type of offshore grid projects. As you, and I'm just showing here a few visions of the future. Of course, the future is uncertain, but what is important is that regu regulation is proactive and does not become a barrier to some of these possible futures. Okay, so that's it. Let me now give you a summary. So what are the answers our research provides to the three questions I have asked your opinion on? So the first question, remember, was about who should design and develop the grid connection. Here we, we argued that what matters is not necessarily who is doing it, but more um, whether the regime includes an advanced connection planning and an element of competition, which in principle could be as included in each of these three models. Then on the second question, who should pay for the grid connection, uh, where you were very nicely divided, here we have a clear answer that offshore wind developers should at least pay shallow charges. So at least their internal grid and the connection to shore. Then the third question, was about who should be uh, the regulator for grid connection. Also here you were uh, relatively divided. And here we have a clear uh, message, which is that offshore grids clearly require collective action at regional and EU level. What exactly you can find in our report, because our report provides very concrete uh, recommendations to European Commission. Okay, so as I already said, all of this comes from a THINK report. And the THINK reports you can download here at this uh, website of ours. If you are interested in other topics we researched on, here is a list for you. 
Currently, we are working on these two topics and these reports will be published in 2013. As you can see, lots of reports produced by a relatively small team of six people, but as you can see here, we are still smiling. That's it for uh, my webinar and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo, with, for the ex excellent presentation. It was very entertaining. I hope that also our audience has the same impression like me. Um, now we can proceed with the Q&A section. I, I just would like to point out one issue that for those of you who uh, will have some further questions, maybe after the webinar, or maybe tomorrow, maybe in the, even in a week time, uh, Leonardo will be available uh, to answer for your question in a separate email. So I hope that you don't mind, Leo, too to answer for some of those questions in the future. My pleasure, my pleasure. Um, okay, so right now let's, let's proceed with the Q&A. The, the first question is regarding the obligation to connect, and I have to say that there were three questions very similar. Uh, first question was about the obligation to connect in Germany, so what are the consequences for TSL if they don't fulfill the obligation? To ah, let me go back to my slides to answer this question. Um, just a second here. So I actually had a table on the current developments in Germany here. And this table comes from our report. But our report was published earlier in 2012. And at that time there were still um, these dates of expected commissioning for these projects. Meanwhile, this summer we saw that uh, Tenet has announced that there are some delays with these projects. So actually it might be that uh, for the first time it's, uh, a TSO is, is struggling with keeping this uh, obligation to connect. And we will find out because honestly we do not yet know what will be um, the result, whether, what, how the regulator will react. So I'm actually looking forward to, to what is going to happen there in relation to these projects. Mm -hmm. uh, the, next the, the next question was exactly the same, but I know that the, the providers for the connections are different in Sweden than in UK, but someone asked how this would look like in, in UK and Sweden, what would be the, the consequences, consequences for the providers out there, if they don't fulfill the obligation? Well, in, in Sweden it's, it's, um, it's the responsibility of the generators themselves. So if they have a delay, they have only themselves to blame because they are developing jointly the connection and the turbine, let's say. So there the TSO has no obligation to connect. Um, then you, the UK here, it is a tender. So who is organizing this tender is um, the, the Ofgem, the regulator. So again here, uh, whether or not there are delays depends on this uh, tender procedure. So in the three systems, there is a very different uh, responsibility for the TSO, you can say. And only this issue of strong obligation uh, only applies to, to Germany. Okay, thank you. Someone asked whether we need the fourth package. <laughs> Take it into account, everything <laughs> you just said, yes. <laughs> That's more... Uh, <laughs> I, uh, that I don't know. But we, what we tried to do is we gave concrete recommendations. So if you have a look at our report or our policy brief, you will find that they are not necessarily fourth package type of recommendations. They are actually quite uh, realistic uh, recommendations of things we can already do within uh, the, the, what we have today. And also you will see in our report that we do believe that for the regional level is a, is a, is a possible uh, level where some of these issues could be dealt with. Why? Because look at Kriegerflag. It is, at the first instance, it's essentially a regional issue. Uh, of course, it has, it, because of the size of the project, it also has an impact which is wider than the region. But some of the issues, like harmonization of responsibilities, could be dealt with at the regional level. So not necessarily in a fourth package. Okay, the next question would be, what specific actions are taking at the European level related to offshore regulatory regime? Which organization? Is it ACER, CER? How does it work at the European Union level? Well, for the moment, the only thing that I know is very specific for offshore is uh, this Adamovich uh, report. That it, so we have a coordinator for offshore grids. So. I, you could say that this is driving at EU level 
the ideas of, of, of policy making. Um, then um, you have the regional level involved and one, one regional initiative to mention is the North Sea Countries uh, Offshore Grid Initiative where I had the pleasure also to present uh, our results. And there you have all stakeholders uh, present discussing all the issues. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's more or less the, the main um, initiatives currently at EU and regional level. Uh, there is also a question um, more precise about the Krieger's flag and the question is, uh, has basically two parts. The first part, if you have a wind turbine in Danish part of the Krieger's flag and it is all in interconnected, can you also cash the German subsidy on wind production? Ah, that's an interesting question. So actually you are now getting into some of the issues we have in the report but I didn't get into in this presentation. So. This is one of the issues we have here in the three dots. So you see the three dots here. So it is very true that this is a big issue also that today most of these uh, support schemes we have for offshore wind assume that you import the energy. So German wind is supposed to be imported in Germany to receive support from the German scheme and the same normally for, for other countries. So this is indeed uh, another issue that requires some alignment or some harmonization to allow these projects to go ahead because the whole idea of this type of project is that you do not necessarily import German wind into Germany anymore. It could be that it goes to Sweden or to, to Denmark. But I mean again we don't need a fourth package for this. Huh? Uh, if if you, you will see in the report what we suggest is that we could use more these existing flexibility mechanisms we already have in the Renewable Directive. So it's, it is already possible for countries to deviate from their uh, national support schemes for a specific project, for instance, like Kriegersflag. So you could imagine that these three countries design a support scheme only for that project, or they could have other arrangements, um, um, like they could even go as far as developing a joint support scheme. And now is the question that is also close to my heart, I have to say. The question is, is there any other recommendations made of report for other countries than Germany, UK and Sweden? For example, Poland that is also nearby. Well, basically for the other countries, these three uh, countries we discuss, the reason why, I mean, why did we select them and not other countries? Well, first is that they have a regime that is already adapted to offshore. Plus, these regimes are very different. So countries that are not part of our analysis can have a look and make up their own mind which of these existing models they think will work best because we don't really conclude on that. Huh? That's the whole idea of, um, of this table, is, is not to conclude that the German model is better than the Swedish model and the UK model. We just assess them from these three points of view. So maybe Poland could try to develop a scheme that is green in, in <laughs> regarding all these three things. Um, yeah, so that's it. So uh, these countries that are still considering whether or not they need a, a specific regime offshore, they, they can learn from these uh, experiences. Okay, so next question will be looking that in the current transmission model in EU onshore, there's no competition. Why introducing competition in offshore grids? What are the differences among onshore and offshore? Okay, so I was a bit short on that point. Maybe I went too fast um, because this, this graph is saying that partly because the whole thing that is different, I mean, what I tried to say was that onshore, it's maybe introducing competition is maybe not worth it. Why? Because it's quite standardized the way we connect generators and the cost is very low. So the cost of introducing uh, competition might be higher than the possible benefit. While offshore, this is different. Offshore, first of all, it's greenfield. So we don't yet know exactly how to connect a generator that is offshore. We are discovering it. And when we discover something, it might be good to have some competition to support innovation and also to reduce the information asymmetry between the regulator and the ones uh, doing these projects. Now, competition does not necessarily mean um, to, to, to have, like in the UK, 
I mean, there is different possibilities to have competition. You could still have a TSO-driven uh, regulatory regime where the TSO is not doing everything, but maybe partly part of the design could be open to competition. I mean, several possibilities exist. The main message is that there is more uncertainties regarding the cost and the technology for offshore. And when there is this uncertainty, competition is more important. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that we, we have time only for another two questions. So uh, the next question will be, in the case of jointly connection of offshore farm in Denmark, who is responsible for allocation of transmission? This question would need to be clarified because I don't know what uh -huh. the person ask, means with uh, allocation of, of transmission. Okay, so uh, this person who asked this question, maybe it's better if, if he sent an email to you later on for precising a bit this um, Yeah, I'll question. be happy to, to interact with, uh, with all of you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. I think that most of the other questions, I, I have to say that they are very long and it will be very difficult to, uh, to ask them without kind of uh, cover the whole story so I would I would recommend to to those participants to contact you directly and maybe have some discussion even telephonically um, because right now it would be it would be difficult to, to explain the whole concept however thank you very much for all the questions and and uh, it, it's really it's really nice that all of you were so active during this webinar and, and answering also for polling so quickly I have to say it, it's really remarkable and uh, right now Leo I will have to say goodbye to you and thank you for today's presentation. It was a pleasure to host you in FSR webinars. <laughs> Me too, and I, I hope we can continue to contribute to your webinars with Think Research, Magda. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, as we said before, all the reports uh, that were published already they are available online, so you can download them uh, directly from the website. I know that some of you have uh, asked me this question during the webinar. And right now, uh, I will say goodbye to Leo. Leo, I have to mute you right now and proceed with the conclusions of today's webinar. So goodbye, Leo. Greetings to all. <laughs> thank you. Bye. And right now I will be able to come back to my computer screen and proceed with, uh, with my presentation. It's just for some final uh, conclusions. So uh, right now, just to conclude for the last couple of minutes. So these are the conclusions. The first announcement is that at the end of this webinar, when I will close the webinar, uh, automatically on your computer screen will appear a survey. And this survey is consisted of eight questions. And I would kindly ask you to fill out this questionnaire because this will help us to evaluate today's session and also make some improvements in our further webinars. And now information that all of you, many of you have asked me during this webinar, whether it will be possible to download the PDF or watch the recording of today's webinar. And the answer is yes. Um, tomorrow you will receive a follow-up email from me where I will ask, uh, well, I will thank you for uh, participating in today's webinar. And also you will find in that email a link to our website where the PDF and the recording of this webinar will be available. Um, there is the archive section in on our website and there you can also find the PDF and the recording of our previous webinar. Also in that email there will be a registration link for the next webinar that will take place in, on 9th of October and uh, in this webinar we will tackle the issue of decarbonization in European Union and in the United States and the speaker of this webinar will be Professor Danny Allerman, the Director of the Climate Policy Research Unit here at Loyola de Palacio Chair in Florence School of Regulation. Um, so as always at 11 a.m. until 12 for one hour we will cover this topic and uh, you can register for that uh, right after you will receive the follow-up email but also you can do that uh, even right now on our home website uh, this is the picture of the website yesterday right now it is updated so in this part where you could have registered for today's webinar right now you will be able to register for the next webinar on 9th of October and also in here if you would like to get to know um, some more information regarding the FSR training, please go to the training section and you will find all information about our training in 2013 um, here.
Okay, however, if you would like to contact me and ask some more questions about the webinar or maybe about any other our trainings, then please use the email that you can see right now on your computer screen. I will be very happy to answer for any of your questions. And like you said, uh, like we said uh, once again, if you have any questions regarding the content of today's uh, presentation, please contact Leonardo Meus by using the email that you can see right now on your computer screen. Okay, so right now it's time to say goodbye. Thank you very much for joining us today. I hope that you will join us once again uh, during our future webinars. And until then, um, I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you very much and goodbye.